NWSAI, hosted by the Northwest Science Writers Association. That's NSWAR for short. Uh, my name is Mark Harris. I'm a board member at NSWAR. Um, and just to let you know, we are recording this event um, for, uh, uh, in, for, for, for our members who couldn't make it, uh, couldn't log on tonight. Um, this is one of our regular events. Um, we held, uh, obviously being held virtually during COVID. Um, and then we look at topics and research of interest um, to our community of science journalists and communicators. Um, the first thing I'd like to say, of course, is um, acknowledge that here in Seattle, we're on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, specifically the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, who are still here and have been here. Um, we honor with gratitude this land and the Duwamish tribe. And I'd also like to extend that gratitude to the traditional peoples and lands of our remote participants tonight. Um, and then we're here tonight, and the, the, the aim of being here tonight is because the University of Washington's um, Tech Policy Lab recently published a fantastic book called Telling Stories, and it explores how artificial intelligence um, is affecting cultures and countries and communities all around the world. Um, it collects 19 short stories from authors, academics, um, activists from Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas, um, each of which takes a unique um, perspective on the impact of AI uh, now and into the future. And if you haven't seen the book, um, it's already it's available as a free download from the lab. Um, there are links on our page. Um, so the format tonight is that um, we're really lucky to have three of the authors here to read their stories um, and then talk a little bit about them, expand why um, they were inspired to write the story. And then afterwards, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, you can find um, the Q&A icon in the, in, the, in the little box toolbar at the bottom. And you can write a question there at any time um, and I'll get to them. Um, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to do a, 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 a because um, Nana here is joining us all the way from Abidjan in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, it's very late at night. Um, so she's going to go first um, after the introductions and then we're going to um, go straight to her questions, uh, you know, directly after, after her reading. Um, and then uh, the other participants will We'll, we'll, we'll do a more general Q&A at the end to which everyone is welcome. So, so please, if you have questions for Nada, please do, do um, write them while, while she's speaking or while she's talking about the work. Um, but right now I'm gonna hand over to Ryan Kahlo here, who's a professor of law and uh, co-director of the Tech Policy Lab. And I'll be back for questions, I'll see you later. Great. Well, thank you so much to, to Mark and to uh, NSWA and of course to our, our panelists, especially um, the ones for whom it's so so late at night or early in the morning. So thank you. Good to see you again, by the way. Um, so I, I'm just going to tell you just a little bit about the Tech Policy Lab um, at the University of Washington. Um, so uh, the Tech Policy Lab is this unique um, interdisciplinary research unit that formally spans uh, computer science, information science, and law. And it has three co-equal faculty directors, myself uh, in law, uh, Batia Friedman, whom uh, you'll, you'll hear from in a moment, uh, in information science, and then um, our colleague Tadayoshi Kono, um, who is a computer scientist, who is so inspired by the Telling Stories <laughs> book that he has not stopped, and he continues to write uh, fiction um, uh, these days, and, and, and so he's, uh, he's, he caught the book. Um, what we do is we, um, our mission is to help policymakers, broadly understood, make uh, more wise and inclusive uh, tech policy. Um, and we do that primarily by putting people into interdisciplinary teams uh, to work on challenging, intricate questions of tech policy. We might do that at the level of a particular technology like augmented reality. Um, we may do it at a particular level of context like cities and open municipal data systems. Um, but we also sometimes take a step back and try to see what we can do to, pr to improve the overall ecosystem in tech policy. And so work like our diverse voices work, which Batia has led, um, tries to address the, the, the way in which tech policy tends to reflect the mainstream uh, by bringing in experiential experts who then um, comment on earlier stage uh, uh, tech policy recommendations and, and, and work product to, to improve it and make sure that um, it's, not, it's not broken for them. Um, so with that you know, short introduction, um, I will say uh, incidentally, in addition to the three faculty directors, we have seven uh, terrific closely held 
faculty associates uh, from a number of other departments, uh, and we have students from all over campus, something like uh, 12 disciplines and counting. Um, okay, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague Batia to talk a little bit more about this particular project, the, the, um, uh, the, the book you're here to hear about. Thanks. You're muted, Batia. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. And again, just so delighted to be here and delighted that three of us can be here to read, um, read stories. Um, so how this project came about is that for quite a long time at the Tech Policy Lab, we have been thinking hard about how do we help bridge the gap between um, technical insights and the direction of technology and the work of policymakers and the very different languages that they speak. Um, so several years ago, maybe three years ago now, Maria Cantwell reached out to the lab. Uh, she's the Senator from uh, Washington and wanted to be briefed about artificial intelligence. And um, Ryan arranged a small group of us to meet with her on a Saturday afternoon in the lab. And there we are in the lab talking about AI. And all of a sudden, she breaks out into the Challenger story. This is when Richard Feynman, in trying to explain why the Challenger exploded to Congress, um, threw some O-rings into a glass of ice water. And you saw the O-rings shatter. And then, uh, he went on to explain what the phenomena was about. And we saw Maria Cantwell reenact that story as a way to explain to her colleagues about the importance of science. And for us, that was a real aha moment because we realized in that moment that having a set of really critical, important, repeatable, retellable stories that are tied to critical issues in the hands of policymakers can be a really important tool for them to communicate with their colleagues and with others about what's essential to people in their interactions with technology going forward. And so based on that, that following summer, we uh, hosted our second global summit on culturally responsive artificial intelligence and invited um, slightly more than 20 individuals from um, all around the world to join us in a story making process. So we gathered for two and a half days and we developed a process which um, led everyone through a very personally situated uh, story generation process within their own um, cultures and contexts. And in fact, one of the things we asked people to do was to bring a piece of fabric from their uh, Society, yes, there. And when we went around the room and met each other for the first time, people introduced themselves through the fabric. And you'll see, um, if you take a look at the book online or the hard copies that'll be available um, in early May, you'll see every story is accompanied by the fabric that came with that author. Um, so what we're gonna do now is share three of those stories with you. And I'm going to, um, pass to our colleague, Nanene, who's going to read her story first for us. So please. Musa Bamba, a biochemist, is invited to a symposium in Vermont. He has checked on visa process for the USA. Thanks to artificial intelligence, they are now fast, reliable, and stress-free. A robot does everything in five minutes. At Uncle Sam, the robot, Musa scans his passport and fingerprints, and a picture of him is taken. Uncle Sam normally makes a decision within 90 seconds. His decision is based on existing data, social media, and other online activities of the applicant. His answer is accompanied by a light, green, yellow, or red. Green is visa granted. Yellow is irregularities noted. Red is visa refused. When Uncle Sam gives you a green light, he prints the visa immediately. Ba, 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 ba. After a minute, Musa gets a red. The robot prints him a page. The top part says visa refused, but the bottom part is all red. Restricted, terror suspect, security threat, shock. Two days later, 
Moses Bank calls him. Doctor, it's about the, your loan application. The headquarters contacted us and asked us to limit our relationship with you to just the transfer of salary and withdrawals. No deposit, no credit. How? Why? Musa Bamba was born in Africa's Savannah Belt. Mostly Muslim, etched in traditional beliefs, his tribe believes that twins bring prosperity. When Musa was born, a cousin arrived three days later. The family so wanted twins that they chose to go to the registry with both babies and declared that they were born on the same day. Each boy was named Musa. That increases luck. Though the birth registration certificates were different, one Musa was 328567, and the other was 328568. The civil registry officer should have raised an objection, but preferred to receive a gift from the Bamba family. One Musa went to do his studies and became a biochemist. He had no social media presence. The other Musa became an activist codenamed Masaka Musa on social media. With posts highly seasoned with bigotry, racial slurs, and religious extremism. After checking birth dates, location, ID number, and facial features, Uncle Sam the robot decided that with 89% match, Dr. Bamba was the massacre master. The robot determined that a radical Muslim biochemist visiting a laboratory in rural Vermont had sufficiently ticked the boxes to be placed on red. He therefore rejected the visa request, placed Musa on red, and updated all relevant data bases. Dr. Musa wants a redress. I'm done. Nina, tell, me, tell us a little bit about um, where this story came from. Does it come from a real experience or is it completely from, from imagination? Um, it's a mixture of both. Um, I was in the, in the global summit that um, Bacha talked about. And I used to travel a lot uh, before COVID and visas were an issue. And you could see that um, a lot of AI is being employed in citizen services, um, in, in identity. And the visa process is one that allies citizen services, defense, security, identity, travel, immigration. There are quite a number of things that are bound up in visa processes. And that is one of the areas where we think that artificial intelligence can do a lot because nobody needs to wait three, five months to get a visa process. And so we breathed a sigh when we had a robot to do it because people are like, okay, the robot is not going to be uh, um, biased either by your gender, by your sexual orientation, by your skin color, by your height or whatever. So. We all thought that AI will solve the problem of biases, that AI will solve the problem of data, um, going sifting through a, lo a lot of data, that AI will do the work faster than a visa officer, and AI will be uh, more automated and more immediate in its response. And that is exactly what we got. And now we got what we wanted, and we find out that there are things that technology cannot do. So that's, that's um, it's part of experience and, and part of it is added in anticipation. For the moment, we, Uncle Sam does not exist. We don't have robots doing US visas. 
Um, you know, but you must have seen forms of this sort of cultural blindness in other technologies, right? I mean, that's something that is. Can, can you talk talk to a little bit about some of the technology? You know, like that that you know uh, the, the real blindness to, to local traditions, local ways of doing things that kind of um, creates unintended consequences, right? No one intended this to be um, uh, a, a problem, but it but it happens anyway. Now, if, if you look, if you take a look back. This, this, this sub, the Sahel and Savannah part of Africa, we have migrant populations, people who, the Tuaregs or whoever, you, whatever you call them, they're actually migrants. And these are people who are not very connected um, and may not have an online life. And so the first question is uh, that I didn't ask there was, is using online activity data enough to, to to, to understand the personality of a person. Mm -hmm. uh, for the US, mostly people in the US, the answer is yes. Everyone, everyone is supposed to have an online presence. Everyone is supposed to be posting things online. And so the data there is kind of um, believable, it's usable, it's exploitable, and mm -hmm. you can integrate it into our algorithm. That's what beliefs. These are things you can't capture. How can a family show up with babies born three days apart and register them. Uh, because we work in civil registry and we believe that all children should be registered. But it's not, there's, there are things you think are okay. I mean, okay, a baby is born, the baby is registered in the national register, the baby even gets a, a national security number or whatever it's going to be called. And hey, and you think as a government, you think that your job is done. And so you can be, we think that that data is, is trust, is 100% trustworthy. But these people are, are faking it. They show up with two babies. They give the same name to the two babies. The registration officer should have said, you can't have twins and give them same, same uh, first names. You should at least add a middle name. But because he was given something, he took it. I don't know if it's $20 or a $50 bill which comes that no matter what technology you have, there's always a human greed and corruption part of it that no AI can solve. And so this guy takes that amount and goes away. These things happened years ago, right? And the two Musas went on to live their lives. It is because we have AI today, we have Uncle Sam delivering visas that we can look back and say that what happened the last thing I want to say is mm. Uncle Sam determined, made his decision based on 89%. So when you have a machine, when you have AI that is making decisions on 89% probability, plausibility, and possibility, you cannot say it did a bad job. But ultimately, it screwed up. Excuse me for the, the French. Because one Musa is not the other Musa. That's what happens. And once the decision is made, because it's AI, it automatically updates all relevant databases. And that it's difficult to, to reverse because now the banks get it. Your identity is automatically changed by data which you do not own and which you cannot even fight against. Now the redress, where is he going to begin his redress? the bank has already put him on red alert. He's on red alert everywhere. Maybe his, the, the schools that his children will go to are going to have him on red alert. His job, he may lose it. He may lose his social security, he may lose his insurance. He may lose so many things because he's now on red alert. How do you get a redress in this? Yeah, that's fascinating stuff. Um, I'll just... Uh... Can I open up questions to, to, to the other panelists? Do you have anything you'd like to ask Nana as well? Well, I mean, I just I just want to re reflect. I mean, one thing you, you did what I what I was so amazing about this story and and many of the stories in the in in the book, but this one in particular to me, is how many different issues you're able to talk about so efficiently. And then at the same time, dramatize. I mean, it's just it's just it's just incredible. I mean, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about um, that you didn't mention just now is the other issue that is like emergent behavior. I mean, it's so you, you didn't mention this, but it's in your story, of course, 
the idea that it was also partly the fact that this completely, um, the sign of success being a bio medical engineer or being a scientist, uh -huh. right, is then coupled with a social media presence. And that was uh -huh. part of it. Right? And, and that's something that like a, this emergent behavior that no one can anticipate because the system's complexity, even yeah. that is represented, you know, and it's just, uh, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Were you, were you sort of thinking about the way in which unintended consequences can combine and, uh -huh. you know, yeah. So, so when, when we, when we, when we allow machines to take decisions, we are, when we allow AI to do make decisions, um, Uncle Sam is like, this guy is a radical, uh, is a Muslim radical coming to the US. He's a biochemist. If you live in the US, you should know Vermont. Vermont is an agricultural area. It's a rural US. He's, he officially, he said he's attending a symposium but we know that he can do a lot of things in rural area, um, in that kind of place. If you maybe if he was going to New York, Uncle Sam would have said, "Okay, he will be under uh, surveillance." But but in rural areas, the surveillance level is low. His 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 uh, his profession is already um, suspicious, and then when you add it to all of this, so. If he were a human being, the human being will ask, um, what is this? What Are you this person or are you not this person? And he would have said yes or no. And the human being would have said, okay, what do you do? Talk to me about what you do. You, you are a professor in a university, but the AI does not have, it does not have conversation. And that's the thing, the, the, emerging, the emerging tendencies are like, just make your decision on data. So evidence-based decision-making, data-based decision-making, Uncle Sam had all of that. And he's like, I know who you are. I know where you come from. I know what you do. I know who you are online. You're not getting into the United States. And it's not just that you're not getting into the United States. You are, you are an alert. You're, you're a security threat and all databases need to be updated because that's actually what happens when you are delivered a visa. It's, it's an immigration process. It's a security process. It's a defense process. It's a finance process. And when we put all of that in the hand of one Uncle Sam in five minutes, a lot of good can be done, but a lot of damage can also be done. Great, and, and I know you had a question about you. Um, should should yeah. we try and squeeze that in before Nina uh, <laughs> falls asleep? You're doing fantastic. Thank you so much. This has been really great. Yeah, so uh, the question I was wondering, and I know we've had the Global Summit back in 2018, so a while ago now, but I'm just wondering if anything stands out for you in um, your writing or your story generation process. I mean, remember that process we went through, but yeah, yeah. and what your reflections are on that. And so COVID has happened and we're, we're getting nearer to the, to, the, to the scenario of Uncle Sam for real, because now we're talking about uh, social distancing. We're talking about reduced human contact. So we're actually getting closer to having an Uncle Sam handle such processes. And you, you, you do recall, Batia, that one of the key uh, uh, key debates during during COVID or the pandemic is identity, the, the, the facial recognition apps, right? So it's even getting real than, than before. And um, now we're talking about the, the vaccine certificate, right? So I think we're gently moving into AI taking over some of these things and, and driverless cars and all of that. So my thinking is that what, what we thought would have been in the future, um, it's getting close to home and, and COVID uh, has, has rushed it. Uh, yeah, it's getting more probable than before. Well, look, thanks, thanks a lot, Nina. That's been absolutely amazing. And um, it's been really lovely to have you here. So thanks a lot. We'll let you either stay or go, but you can turn your camera off if you want and then come back to the questions later or whatever whatever works for you. But thank you so much. Sure. Um, and then maybe Ryan, should we, we go to your um, we go to your story next? 
Yeah, I, I only I only figured out in the last uh, a few minutes that I had to read it, and this is the first time I've ever read it out loud. So I'm I'm a little nervous about it, but I'll I'll, I'll give it a I'll give it a, a, a whirl since uh, uh, Nana uh, led the way here, and <laughs> and Bhatia have to agree to go too. Um, okay, so this my story is called um, the box. Joshua marvels at the machine he made, versatile, user centric. Its capabilities speak for themselves. The box gobbles, digests, spits out information of nearly any origin. Why should only a handful of humans on the West Coast of the United States have access to the box? Joshua resolves then and there to send pre-market units to every populated continent. Distributing the box will take resources. Joshua thinks, at this price, I could feed everyone in South Seattle. And then he thinks, teach a man to fish. He has the money and he has the time and he gives himself permission. Time passes. How are all the many scattered people using his technology? Joshua searches for videos and news articles. He reaches out through the box itself, federated but connected, and solicits stories. Reports flow in. Don has planned a wedding. Azra used the box to orchestrate a short squeeze. Niran reads by its light. The box, um, the box is a doorstep in Devonshire. In Japan, it powers an exhibit involving dolls. Someone in Samara is collecting boxes to donate, um, to decorate a zealously modern bathroom. Is this everything? Where's the sea change? Where's the army of young Chinese girls with revolutionary tendencies? That reference as an aside is from um, one of my favorite books, uh, 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 The Diamond Age. Um, by Neil Stevenson. Um, more dispatches. Boxes have been confiscated. Boxes have been denounced. The box uh, records a fatal shooting from its position under the arm of a Black American. Have I done well? Have I done good? The box, gorged on knowledge but with no taste for meaning, has the same chance of answering as the rain. When Joshua cannot see is Uma, village screwdriver in hand, taking the box apart, marveling at its simple complexity. The box showed up belonging to no one. The innards revealed themselves easily, yet it took Uma years of questions and bus trips and books to uncover the intricacies of the underlying code. Uma, older still, professor of engineering, marvels at the machine Joshua made. She marvels at his choices. Imagine shipping an expensive device to the Sahara with no dust guard. Imagine a genie without a wish list. Imagine building a device capable of answering any question except about itself. That's great. What what's the box, and why doesn't it matter? <laughs> <laughs> well, so so um, it's funny to it's it's funny to me. Um, I, this was years ago, you know what I mean. And you see you see a reference, for example, to um, a fatal shooting of an African American, um, and and that that years ago. And the reason is is because I you know um, in, in my first thing in my career was to investigate. Um, allegations of, of police misconduct. And so I actually investigated um, uh, uh, and, ha and, 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 and have been thinking about for, for a long, long time, you know, po police use of force in the United States and, that, that is racialized. And so, I mean, this, this sort of like brought together a, a, um, a few different things in my life. You know, another one was, it's very personal to me. Another, another one is that um, the, the reference to Chinese girls with revolutionary tendencies is because of, um, the the young illustrate the, the the diamond age or a, a, a young woman's illustrated primer which was one of my favorite books and in fact that was the inspiration ultimately for the story because in that story somebody just disseminates these tablets right and they and they um and 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 people pick them up and the protagonist is is a, a Chinese um a girl who picks up this this tablet um and uh, and 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 it, and it and it it, it like she learns from it and it keeps adapting to her and, and it brings in people from all over the world uh, into contact with her uh, to, 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 in order for educational purposes, but it turns out to have some kind of ulterior motive and, and, and so on. And so I'm just kind of weaving pieces together, you know, from of things that I, that I like and things that I think about uh, into a story. And, you know, I, I don't write short story. So <laughs> it was all I knew to do, but it was sort of encouraged by the, by the processes that, that, um, 
you know, we, we put into place with Bhatia's leadership, so. I mean, it, it was interesting to me because it raised, it raised the question in my mind, of, should Joshua be expected to imagine all the uses of the box? Is he, does he have a legal or a moral responsibility if it's misused? And that's kind of, and that, I, I think that's kind of what you're going at, right? Is, is, is how much thought and the sort of thought processes do we want Joshua to take before he packs these boxes off around the world? Yeah, I mean, for me, for me, this, you know, again, you know, it, it's, um, we, we, ever since the death of the author, it's not really about what I intended, is it? It's about sort of what you re read into it, right? And so I'm glad you read that into it. I mean, what I, what I was thinking about was the impossibility of predicting how technology will come to interact with the cultures to which to in, to which it's exposed, mm -hmm. right? It's he he builds in a particular co uh, uh, a cultural context in Seattle, um, and he which is also where Neil Stevenson, the author of um, The Diamond Age is from. Um, and, and so he has an idea about people will use this thing and he and, and, and it's, but it's a very Western conception. And in fact, it's, it's a West Coast conception of that. Um, but then when it actually is disseminated, um, the use cases are, are all over the place. Some are decorative, some, some are, you, you have ut utility to them. You know, and, and in one case, at least, Someone takes it apart to see, like, how is this thing, how is this thing made? You know what I mean? And so it's it's a story, kind of the story that science and technology studies tends to tell about the impossibility of knowing in advance precisely how technology will shape the societies and how it will be shaped by, by the society that it's in. Um, and so to, to me, it's not, it's less a story about responsibility. I mean, you know, some some people perhaps are getting hurt. Most of the use cases are not evil. You know what I mean? I mean, most of the use cases are just um, are fine. You know, but it's it's about the it's about the impossibility of knowing um, precisely how technology will interact with culture. That that's what I was trying to sort of get at with it. Mm. I, I think it inevitably does raise the question of I mean, does that abrogate him from any responsibility, right? Or does he, you know, you're right. Obviously, it's impossible to see how things will, will ever, you know, truly develop, but. It's kind of interesting to me that, that, that I think it does raise the question of like, should he be doing basic stuff like, you know, like sandproofing it or making sure it doesn't electrocute someone or, you know, the kind of, you know, the ground level here. We, I mean, that's kind of where we have to start from, isn't it? Just like, um, the, you know, the don't be evil <laughs> level. Yeah. Yeah. But isn't it, isn't it interesting, Mark, how you're going there, right? So, so um, the stories we tell about technology so often gravitate towards what's a bad use case. Mm -hmm. And like I allude to that, I mean, and so, you know, again, this was written years ago, but, the, uh, you know, to orchestrate a short squeeze, if you know what a short squeeze right. is, it's very literally what happened with GameStop right. a couple of months ago, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. and so there is a sense in which, you know, so, so it's not great to orchestrate a, a short squeeze. I mean, if you get a, 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 a some kind of AI device mm -hmm. that, ha that has an input and output uh, capability, and you use it to like, manipulate the market so you can extract value from mm -hmm. stocks falling. You, you know what I mean? Like that's not mm -hmm. great. And that's also not great that the Robinhood app mm -hmm. contributed to that or that or that uh, Reddit contributed to that. You see what I mean? And mm -hmm. so it's like, you know, but at the same time, um, I purposely avoided um, right. really bad stuff, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, I, because I knew others, first of all, I had the benefit of knowing other people's stories. So I knew that a lot of a, a lot of what's, you know, I mean, we just heard a story, which is where a person's life is 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 begin, be, being ruined, you know, by by um, by emergent properties of technology and its intersection with culture. Sorry, I just love that story so much; it's so great. Um, but but anyway, the point is, that we had a bunch of stories like that, and so I was telling a story that that got at something very specific, which is the impossibility of of being able to predict. And I did it, Mark, because I feel like people in my field in law and technology often have pretty limited imaginations about, mm -hmm. about all the complexity and all the, all the ways that all the trajectory of, of technology can be. They, they tend to assume they tend to assume technology is going to have a sort of specific deterministic effect. And that's what we have to respond to. You know what I mean? As opposed to a pluralistic complex interaction that we don't know in advance, you know? Um, so anyway. Great, I'd, I'd love to hear if the, if, the, if the other panelists want to, want to jump in with something there. Oh. 
Okay, well, then maybe Batia, should we go to, we can go to, uh, Batia, can, can we go to your story? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to share. Um, so my story is called What Justice? And it actually begins with um, a quote from Mr. Roland Amasuga, who was the spokesperson for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Uh, and it comes from a collection called The Voices from the Rwanda Tribunal, uh, recorded in Arusha, Tanzania in 2008. And so it begins, uh, Mr. Amasuga begins uh, with this quote. An old lady, 85 years old lady, whose kids were all killed, husband killed, and she was raped. And I brought her in here to court to testify in the first case. And this lady, when she entered the courtroom, we prepare her. When she entered the courtroom, she was smiling. And when they asked her, witness, could you identify the accused person? And when she came to see the accused person, she bowed to the accused person. And she went back and sat. The judges say, can you point the finger? Say, in my culture, you don't point the finger to powerful people. No, he was the mayor and the mayor was the most powerful. And the court agreed, the court agreed that the lady has recognized the accused person on the basis of that sign. And then when we went home, I said, mama, how do you feel? I'm so happy. I could not believe that I'll have this day in my life to see the son of God to be here with handcuff. No, it's not possible. I can die today and go and see my kids and report back to them that justice has been done. End of the quote from Mr. Amasuga. So our story above is based in fact. In the trial of Akiesu, the panel of judges at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda recognized the old mama's dilemma to witness and also to respect powerful people. And in their wisdom, accepted her nuanced gesture, lifting her eyebrows, in lieu of their instruction to point a finger. In this detail, culturally responsive justice, dignity. 2048, a future tribunal. The personal backgrounds and biases of black, white, and brown judges are gone. Instead, the witness, an old grandmother faces a panel of metal and plastic judges with hidden circuits, diodes, and computer code. The metal judges ask, can you point the finger to the accused person? The grandma gestures to the accused. The judge's AI gesture recognition system interprets the witness had pointed to the accused. Judgment, guilty. 2048, the day after. Headlines in The Hague read, efficient AI judges make good on international justice. Those in the Silicon Valley, quote, in international courtroom, AI gesture recognition systems deliver culturally responsive justice, end quote. The old grandmother returns to her town. Neighbors ask, how do you feel now? Empty, she says quietly, empty. I know he was found guilty, I know he will be punished, but what do these metal judges know of the pain I suffer? How does this cold metal help me to heal? The neighbors nod their heads, agreeing. They too had family members killed. One says, tell me, where in the courtroom was there a human being who looked him in the eye and said, you are guilty, you murdered. How can we heal in this community if no person has said this to him? Where is our humanity in this metal courtroom? Indeed, she sighs and shudders, indeed. Well, that's really, really powerful stuff. That's just really interesting, really a really a, a strong story. And I think what got me there was you we're jumping past what we're thinking about today, which is bias in AI. And you're sort of getting the, the wider issue that even if such a thing as a bias AI is possible, it's still going to fall short. It's still going to disappoint us. 
is, 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 is was that kind of your thought behind it that there's that there's always going to be something missing uh yes yeah, so i i have had the privilege opportunity to um have done this work with the ictr and talk with many people in Rwanda about their ideas about justice and what it means to be positioned to heal. And I've come to understand that um, different cultures and different societies have different ideas about the work you need to do to heal. And so if we are going to have justice, we have to pay attention um, to those things. So in the reflections on my story, I uh, wrote these few words. Justice is more than a right decision. It is a process of human beings witnessing for each other, recognizing each other, accounting for each other, restoring each other. Nothing less than compassion underlies the conditions in which we can restore ourselves, heal and move forward in life. And I think that, you know, as we design these technological systems and integrate them into our social lives, we need to really stay focused on who and how we are human beings and what it is that we need to experience our humanity. And in the case of harms and recovery from harms, we need to really think about those processes and foreground those when we do our technical designs. Um, so that's what this story is about. It's about you know, having us refocus our attention on what it really means to be human what it means to experience justice, what it means to heal, and, um, and examine our technical solutions or ideas for technical solutions in light of those things. Because we're already seeing um, AI start to come into things like sentencing, right? Which again is one of these, I mean, it's obviously not quite in the, as an extreme example as judging, but it is sort of judging as in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a way, can you talk to, you know, do, do you have an opinion on how that is being implemented and, and, and how it could be better implemented? Yeah, and I think this um, relates to another project that um, Ryan mentioned, our Diverse Voices project, mm -hmm. which brings experiential experts to look at policies as they are um, coming together. We ran a panel with people who were formerly incarcerated looking at some of the uses in the justice system. And um, one of the things that um, people said, this was in the state of Washington and around um, the access to justice technology principles here in the state of Washington. And one of the things that people on that panel said is that um, they want human touch. So if I remember, um, and this is a, an approximate quote, but someone said if, um, you know, if a parole officer is going to deny me the opportunity to spend a year with my child, I want a human being to look me in the face and the eye and say, no, you're not going to be able to be there for your kid's birthday. You're not going to be able to be there when your kid has a bad day at school. Um, and I think that that those are the things that, you know, matter to us as, as human beings and, you know, help us experience our dignity, even through these very difficult and trying kinds of circumstances. So it speaks very clearly to um, systems that are being designed to do sentencing. No system is going to feel the loss of not being able to be there for your kid's birthday or be there to comfort your kid when they've had a bad day. Um, and that's an essential piece. Um, have you seen any positive examples about how technologists are thinking about centering humans' emotions and human psychology in, in their technologies? Is it, is it, I mean, or is it still at a very early age, a very early stage? Well, I think, um, you know, any of these technologies are not a priori positive or negative. It's how right. we use them and the ways in which we use them. So when you ask the question like that, for me, what I start to think about are people who perhaps struggle with their emotions in certain ways and ways in which we could use technology to um, help them. So for example, um, you know, let's say that you were um, an autistic person and having trouble expressing certain emotions. Perhaps we could design a technology that could help with that expression. So my students, for example, have um, written a scenario around a technology called uh, Sleeve. Stephanie Ballard wrote this. It's a technology that you know, has a little connection brain machine interface 
and then it connects to the fabric of the clothes that you're wearing and it helps to make um, your emotions more visible, sort of wearing them on your sleeve, so to speak. The fabric changes. So for somebody who uh, isn't very skilled at expressing their emotions and wants to do so, then maybe a, te a technology like that, um, you know, used carefully could be helpful. And of course, they may not want all of their emotions exposed or only emotions exposed at certain times. So how do you regulate that it becomes part of the design challenge. But you can see a potential there in a certain way in certain circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if the panelists would like to jump in with some questions, I would love to hear questions from the panelists. I would also like to encourage um, the participants to, to, to get those questions going because I'll um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to those in a moment. But uh, first of all, the, the panelists want to, to, to talk to Patrick for a moment. No technical, okay. Um, so I think you know, what I'd like to, I mean, these are, these are three quite different topics, but obviously having a common theme. Um, and I think what I would like to, to, to get from, from you, or all, all three of you, or any three of you, is um, what should, communicators like us, science and technology journalists and communicators, keep in mind when we're writing about AI, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, you know, very breathless talk about AI technologies. There's also a lot of talk right now about, um, a lot of, you know, highly critical stories about AI. So I just wanted you to, to, to help us um, when we're going about our business of writing and thinking about AI, do you have any sort of suggestions or recommendations? If I may hop in here, um, I think I put a thought down on chat. The challenge is what we want is the balance between what we want and what we get. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking from the design, from, from the programming point of view, uh, the way programmers think is, oh, we wanted to do this, this, that. What data do we need? How do we program? How do we do this? How do we do so, someone's gonna have a technical programming point of view, which is great. And that person is gonna to pitch to us, this is what AI will do, A, B, C, D. And as writers, you might want to get carried away, if I may use that word, by what you've been told, by what, what, we, will, what we want, right? We say, we want this, we want this, we want this, okay. And then we launch it. We get it. We get it going. We celebrate it. We we invest in it. But then what we get is certainly different from what we want because you are going to get what you want plus extra things that you might not have programmed, minus other things that you didn't think about. So as writers, it is very important that we ask ourselves: Yes, this is what we think we are going. This is what we want. This is what we're programming AI to do. Uh, this is what we think it will do. But then the outside of that, what are the other things that it might not do or it might do? Uh, the, the question of emotions, human emotions. And um, just today I was having a discussion with a friend. The first article on the Declaration of Human Rights is all human beings are born equal in right and in dignity, right? That, that, those are things you can't code. You can't code dignity. You, you can code actions and stuff, but emotions and, and things that are very personal are very hard to code, to program. It's really very difficult for metal to take away. Like, like, like the Bacha story, that looking into your eye. Okay, let me just say this, you know, since banking has gone electronic, I miss the time when, when you can walk into a bank and just scream like, Who, where's my money? You know, you need to scream at a human being. It makes you feel better. You know, the person is not going to solve your problem, but that you were to, able to scream into someone's face, it's, it makes you feel good. I, you, I mean, what am I doing screaming onto a machine? You'd be like, can you say that again? <laughs> uh, I did not understand. Can you choose one? I mean, if ang for, for angry, choose one. For not very angry, choose two. No, I'm going to kick the hell out of you. You know that kind of. So uh, the, the the balance is 
for, for, for you writers to seek what exactly are we, do we want and what are we getting and what might we get and might, what might we not get. Uh, technology may not solve all of our problems, it's going to solve some, but we need to keep going beyond what AI is going to do and ask ourselves what will be missing. We know we'll get something, but then what are we not going to get? And it's important that we get informed as we take these decisions, whether they are policy, tech, or design. Yeah. Ryan, do you want to jump in? Oh, um, sh sure. I, so, I mean, you know, um, I mean, I think that I think that uh, 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 one of the things that I see in in uh, science and tech reporting sometimes. Um, it is taking people's taking people's word for not for something not not for factual not not for factual statements right because I mean I think that you know journalists are excellent of course at um you know cr cross checking what people are saying and making sure they understand the facts editors are good at you know um, making sure that things are are um, fact checked it's more like around the frame of something. You know, and so, you know, I wish that I would see more in the AI space of pushing back against um, certain kinds of frames that are really alluring and really, and but ultimately somewhat specious. So for, for one, one example is the idea that AI is a race. It's like a race between nations that we're all racing to figure out who can, you know, and that, and that somehow when somebody, I don't know what, I mean, gets ahead on AI or something like that, you know, and the truth of the matter is, is that you know, artificial intelligence is a set of techniques um, and uh, it, it, those techniques vary. Many of them have been around for a long, long time. Um, and as the, the science of artificial intelligence moves forward in, when, when nations fastest, when nations are in dialogue, you know, I mean, when we're reading papers from China and they're reading our papers and, and um, when we have labs like at the University of Washington, where we have people from other countries coming to study with us or be postdocs with us. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, it's, it's, it can be awfully attractive to say, oh, yes, it's a race who's winning the race. And I'm so worried about that. You know, and that, that strikes me as, as, as wrongheaded. Um, an, another example is um, when you just take, you just take um, the, the uh, source's word for the fact that something is that the current configuration of something is inevitable and not contingent. And so, for example, say you're doing a story on, on delivery robots and you're talking to somebody from a company that does delivery robots, you know, they're going to tell you a story about how you got to do it the way that they're doing it. You, you have to have like these little carts and, and, and they have to go on the sidewalk and so on, you know, but you could ask yourself like, well, gosh, I mean, you know, what are the, what are the affordances that make drone, uh, drone delivery on the ground or in the air possible? And is this the best use of, 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 those, of those technologies? You know what I mean? And so I just think, I think resisting the frame um, and, and understanding that the technology is ultimately um, contingent and, and usually not inevitable um, can, can, be, can be really helpful for, for reporting. Um, but Mark, you do that, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, Carol I like, has a question. But, but, but it's hard, isn't it? Because, um, you know, when I see somebody say like, this is a great, a piece of education technology, we can scale it up and we can suddenly serve millions of people instead of having a human teacher teach four people. But as you say, what are you losing with the losing the human person? And, and, what, are you, and what, what cultural baggage, what digital colonialism goes in the AI that is suddenly everyone seeing? I, 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 it, it's, it's a tough question for me, right? I, I don't know. I, I don't, it's tough. I mean, Patrick, did you have, do you have a, a view on this as well? Yeah, so well, I, um, I, of course, really like the diplomatic framing of my colleague Ryan on uh, reframing. <laughs> I think that was really nice. What I was going to say is, um, uh, I think, a deeper honesty in reporting. I think there's tremendous amount of um, hyperbole and hype, and I don't think that that serves anybody well. So I, I would just appreciate um, plain talk about what the technology is and what it isn't and where it might come up short. And I think that would serve the public um, much better. The other thing I think um, could be really helpful is to practice and cultivate, um, as Mark, you were really just starting to do, um, thinking at scale and thinking about not just the demonstration system, but 
what would happen if this technology really caught on and became pervasive in the, it, let's say in um, the United States, then we're talking about culturally responsive AI, so appropriated elsewhere around the globe. What would those implications be and begin to sort of ferret those out and help people early on think about those things? I think that um, science reporting can play a real role in helping the public um, think about those issues and learn how to think about those issues, cultivate, give them questions. So almost think about what are the questions that you give the public about the technology. And then my third point would be um, a, a general statement really having to do with the planet. You know, the planet we live on is, is finite yet regenerative. And these technologies that we're talking about depend on, um, even though they exist in the cloud, right? We have this metaphor, this mental model of the cloud, they actually require huge amounts of servers. Um, those servers suck up huge amounts of power that has to be generated. Um, they generate a lot of heat, so then they have to be cooled with water. There's cables, wires, vast amounts of um, metals taken from the earth, et cetera, et cetera. The material impact of the technologies um, and hardware that support the AI is enormous. And I think a critical question is, are the anticipated benefits of AI on balance worth what it is we are taking from the earth? And can we actually support the level of computation that um, these kinds of systems are going to require given the planet that we're living on and given the other kinds of concerns that we have? I mean, is that what we should be doing with the energy that we're generating? Is that what we should be doing with the water that we have on the planet? Or should we be using that energy to, you know, build um, different kinds of processes for clean water for more people on the planet? And I think we need to ask those questions. We have limited resources, we have limited time, we have limited, you know, engineering imagination. Where should we be directing it? It's not clear to me that, um, the AI processing is really um, in this moment, historical moment, um, the best choice for us on the planet. So I think science writers have an opportunity to contribute to that conversation. Um, here's a question from Carol Wilson, um, one of our members. Um, what stories can we tell now that help illustrate some of these issues and how can we discover them? I think that's kind of an interesting story to me that how do we discover these stories how, rather than being fed the product of the press releases from the AI company that has a new thing that beats a new chess game or, or a video game. And that's such a, a really fascinating and really great question. In some ways, that's what motivated us to do this story project. And I think for culturally responsive AI, these 19 stories are a starting point. Um, and we wrote and included a story writing template at the back of the book so that others can write stories. And I wonder if there are ways of, you know, inviting others to write stories that could help surface some of these kinds of things. Um, but it's a really, a really great question. Yeah, I'm not sure that we're necessarily the, the best people to be able to answer <laughs> that. I mean, we, we do our own thinking and we contribute our own stories, but, but how do you find that socius of people who are contributing these stories? Nene? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one thing we're doing today that we'll be embarrassed about in 20 years, I think it's clearly thinking that artificial intelligence is about technology. Mm -hmm. I think that if we technologize, I, I don't know that's English, the idea, and we keep working on technical improvements, we keep working on code and data, and we keep doing metal things, uh, if, I, if I can borrow from Batia, I think that, the, the, and by the way, if we, if we keep doing Silicon Valley things, if, if, I could, if, we, if we keep doing connected people stuff, stuff based on inter connecti broadband connectivity, we keep doing technical things, we keep doing programming, we keep doing data, and we think that is all that there is, and we don't pay attention to the human side of it. We will get to the point, um, where, where most of us are going now, uh, where we'll have driverless cars, 
we are going to have electric cars and then when we take them into places that have neither electricity and then we're like uh, what are we going to do with it so i think that one of the things we're doing now that we will eventually regret is to think that ai is about technology alone we need to broaden the thinking broaden the digging and and see what we are what we are missing out and and if we need to slow down on some things uh, on some applications of artificial intelligence then let's do it uh, but ultimately i believe that um, I, i'm hoping and praying that we won't realize too late that it's not just about technology but about human beings ultimately it's about humanity not about technology Yeah, I, I would just, uh, I, I think we're at an, at an hour, but um, I, I was just going to say that um, I don't know, I, I, this is a hard thing to do, I think, probably as a, as a journalist, but, um, you know, I have to say that time and again, we have conversations in the academy. So, for example, at the big annual Privacy Law Scholars Conference, you know, every year it bounces between um, uh, Berkeley and, and George Washington. And we have these conversations, and um, you know, three years later, we see in the in the in the news enormous amounts of discussion of it. Right. So, for example, we were talking about dark patterns um, at Privacy Law Scholars Conference like four years ago, you know, and now there's an FTC hearing on it, and every other story about privacy is about dark patterns and this and that. You know what I mean? And so it's so I think you know to the extent that you have the discipline, I wouldn't. To, to ask people, what are you guys working on now? You know what I mean? And then kind of, and then kind of just take the note and kind of put it to the side because it won't be timely yet, you know? And then maybe you can, you can pull that back out and be ahead of the curve. I mean, that, that's sort of strategic, but um, you know, I, I do notice that, that, that in my line of work, we often have robust conversations about things that the public has, you know, a few years later. Um, which is gratifying at one level, you know, you're like, you know, I'm sure that we talk about lots of things that no one ever cares about, but we, we often talk about things that people end up caring about and it's gratifying to see that. But, um, you know, it just, it, it, I think that you could see around the corner a little bit by following sort of what some academics are talking about. Um, and just one more question I wanted to get in there before, um, before we wrap up was, um, you know, we can see some situations where the genie's out of the bottle. And, you know, I think the most recent example is, you know, in China, where you had ubiquitous surveillance and ethnic facial recognition systems being set up to target certain populations. And that's, that's out there. So, I mean, the design questions are great and the, the idea that you can get a, uh, you know, responsible development of, this, of, of, of AI. But once the gene is out of the bottle and you need to control it, there's obviously a political aspect that element there as well. I just wanted to get um, have your thoughts on that and, and how you can have, you know, I guess all politics is going to be culturally responsive because it's going to be created in the country that is enacting it. But ju ju just how that all feeds in, yeah, you know, the, the political angle feeds into this uh, culturally responsive AI as well. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about the work of Sheila Jasanoff on socio socio technical imaginaries. Um, she's a, a prominent science and technology studies scholar, and you know she talks about how. The sort of grand narratives that that countries tell themselves about particular technologies or techniques, in turn, influence coverage uh, by the media and influence um, influence uh, regulation. And she, her her perhaps best known example of that is actually um, uh, nuclear power in the United States, and I believe it's South Korea, um, where she sort of talks about you know the way that Americans think about nuclear power as being this this weapon, this monster that needs to be tamed. Do you know what I mean? And it's hard, it was too, it's, we have to harness, it's too powerful not to, but it's, we are constantly worried about, versus, um, you know, the story is in South Korea, it's a story about uh, what distinguishes that country and about innovation. And it's just a, a different frame, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, and I think that's, that's, that's the sort of power of, um, <laughs> that's the sort of power of narrative at a, at a high level. I mean, I'm not sure how much, you know, and I'm not sure you, you, how much I think it's always the case. It's an, it's an interpretation of what's going on, but um, it has some explanatory power, at least in the context that I've seen her deploy it. So um, I think we probably 
could could do some of that, you know, around AI. You know, we can talk about why do we think of it like a race? Why why do we essential? Why, why do we think about AI as like a single thing, like as if it's a one thing when in fact it's many techniques that have in some cases been around for for since the fifties. You know what I mean? Like um, it's, there's something deep going on there. I just don't I just don't know how to unpack it. But I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there and just say thanks for hosting us. <laughs> Well, look, thanks. This has been absolutely fantastic. I want to hand over to um to Ashley now to say a few words at the end. But um, the, uh, our heartfelt thanks for uh, for taking the time out to to help us understand a little bit more about the work you've been doing and uh, the work that that we're all going to be doing a little bit as as technology develops. Yes, absolutely. I just wanted to um, extend our thanks to Alex Bolton and the University of Washington Tech Policy Lab for helping us pull together this event, as well as to our excellent speakers tonight, um, Nana, Ryan, and Batia. Um, thank you so much, especially for staying up so late um, and, and sharing <laughs> these stories with us. Um, I really enjoyed, you know, looking through the lens um, that each of you brought and helped think about these you know, complex issues in, um, you know, really different ways and, and uh, really, really just appreciate um, your, your sharing that with, um, with us and, and with our members. And um, again, we'll be, this is being recorded, so we will um, make this available to our members who couldn't make it afterwards. Um, and then I just wanted to um, sort of uh, take care of a little bit of housekeeping with the Northwest Science Writers Association. Um, I wanted to let people know that we have, um, uh, congratulations to Sabrina Tapa, who is the NSWA member we will be supporting for uh, our career development awards um, for um, the Writers Co-op for uh, uh, the Mastermind Journalism um, Support Group. And uh, just to say that we have um, another career development award opportunity for freelance writers who are also parents um, to receive um, sort of similar support through the Writers Co-op. Um, and we have applications for that um, for any NSWA member um, who is a freelancer and a parent who would like some extra support um, and commiseration and coaching. Um, uh, we have applications um, available on our website, nwscience.org, and those applications are due Tuesday, March 23rd at 11.59 p.m. Um, also, just uh, keep an eye out for a future event that we're working to organize that's going to be um, focused uh, on sort of the principles of diversity, equity, justice, and inclusion um, when looking at language and style guides, um, which are these, you know, references that we writers and communicators use um, in our daily lives. And so just stay tuned for more, um, watch our newsletters for that. Um, and then again, just thank you to everyone for joining us and um, enjoy your evening wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks.